In a couple of weeks, we have Mother's Day. That is traditionally a day that we have a lot of visitors, a lot of guests. And uh, to accommodate that, we are going to do the concurrent service schedule again, the same that we did for Easter. And we thank you all for being so patient and, uh, and so accommodating with that. It went off really well. There were a few little details behind the scenes. One thing that I didn't account for is when I take communion. So I didn't take communion. I didn't even account for that. Didn't even think about it. I'm leaving one service to come to the other. And so Sunday night, I walk into the room to take communion. And my son was serving it. And he said, what are you doing here? And I said, I... I I didn't even consider that detail. That was the major detail that I missed. But other than that, it all went very smoothly. And so we're going to try it again on Mother's Day and and hope that you will accommodate us again, uh, just like we did the last time. You know, uh, at the commencement ceremony for Stanford University students several years ago, the speaker got up and he made a very profound uh, statement. And within the context of that statement, he said these words. He said, You've got to find what you love. Your work is going to fill a large part of your life. And the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking and don't settle. As with all matters of the heart, you'll know when you find it. And like any great relationship, it just gets better and better as the years roll on. Don't stop looking and don't settle. Now, the guy that said those words to the graduating students at Stanford University was Apple co-founder and CEO Steve Jobs, who has since passed on. And within the context of these words, he asked a question, a question that he says he asked himself on a daily basis. And the question was this, if today were the last day of my life, would I want to do what I'm about to do today? We might ask it another way. We might say, is the way you're currently living, is the life you're currently living going to get you to heaven? Or maybe we ask it like this, would you change anything on your schedule if you knew that this was the day that our Lord would return, that this would be your last day on earth? Before you answer that question, or those questions, I want you to listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 15. Starting in verse 1, it says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may, may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. And you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Steve Jobs' advice was to keep looking for that one thing that you can do that will make you happy. And Jesus says, stop looking. I can tell you where it is. You found it. You have found the secret of life, and it is this. Abide in me. Abide in me, and I will abide in you. That's it. That's what life is all about. Sure, your work is important. And I know that that your career is important to you, and your kids are important to you. And you want to build a happy home, and you want to plan for retirement and all those things. But at the end of the day, Nothing in your life, nothing will ever find meaning in your life separate and apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ. He even said it himself, apart from me, you can do nothing. I say all this because we are a people of productivity. Productivity is a major virtue in our culture, right? I mean, it seems like everything we do in our culture is based on productivity. 
It is highly esteemed. It is ingrained within us. It is the basis for our economic system. Those who produce the most get rewarded with more. Those who are lazy, who don't produce much, they don't get rewarded, right? We talk about it in the realm of academics. Those students who work hard, they achieve results. And those who don't work hard get lost in the system. And in, in, in the college realm, in, in professors, they live by the mantra, publish or perish. Even in our political debates. Those political debates center around poverty and welfare and health care and who deserves it and who doesn't. So much of our lifestyle is about productivity and, and, and hinges on productivity. It is at the core of almost everything that we do. And I think that many times it seeps into our mentality as Christians. And we think that in order to be pleasing to God, we have to be productive. If I do more, I please God more. The more I do, the more I earn his favor. And we read passages like John 15, and we assume that Jesus is talking about productivity. If you bear much fruit, you're going to earn God's favor. He's going to be pleased with you, and you're going to go to heaven. If you don't produce fruit, your, vine's going to be, or your branch is going to be cut off from the vine, and you're going to be charbroiled for all eternity. And that's how this whole thing works. It's about being productive. And if you're unproductive, you're unpleasing to God. But that's a surface reading of the text. That's allowing our mentality to seep in as we read the text. There's so much more here. There is a bigger issue that Jesus is approaching here. And we can't afford to miss it. The problem is that Jesus is speaking about more than productivity. He's not just addressing live branches versus dead branches. He's not just addressing those who produce fruit and are pruned and those who are cut off and thrown into the fire. This isn't about productivity because productivity is all about transactions. Productivity is just about being busy. That's it. No, Jesus is talking about something deeper here. And you know what he's talking about? He's talking about connectivity. Abide in me. Be connected. I don't know if some of our parents have dealt with this. When my kids were, I don't know, about the seventh grade, when they started going on school functions where they left the school and rode on the school bus, whether it be for extracurricular activities like sports or academics or something like that, we got them a cheap cell phone so that they could stay connected to us. So that they could call us when they got back to the school so that we could come pick them up. Or if there was an emergency or something of that nature, they could call us. Now, of course, they've used some of their money and they've gotten, you know, higher tech phones, you know, their, their iPhones and all these kind of things. I don't know about you, but it frustrates me to no end. When one of my kids texts me and I'm not able to text because I'm driving down the road, so I call them instead and they don't answer. You just had your phone. You just texted me. That phone is attached to your body at all times. I know that it's not more than arm's length away from you. How are you not answering the phone when you just texted me, right? Even if it's on silent, you're hearing it vibrate. You're probably feeling it vibrate. But what I've learned about kids is that the phone is a seldom used app on their phone. <laughs> they don't use their phone to call people. They use it for Instagram and all those other things, but they don't use it to call people. I buy a phone for my kids. I provide them with a phone because I want to stay connected. That's what it's all about. It's about connectivity. And I've had to put my foot down more than once to say, look, if I'm going to provide you a phone, you had better answer it every single time I call you. Otherwise, you don't have a phone. Because that's why I purchased it for you in the first place, so that I could stay connected to you. When we talk about John 15, that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about connectivity. Jesus wants that. He wants connectivity. And, and he says that it's not about productivity. It all starts with abiding. Fruit production or lack thereof is simply a manifestation of our attachment to the vine. That's what it's all about. Some reach the erroneous conclusion that John 15, 1 through 11 is talking about making disciples, that that's the fruit that's being talked about here. It could include that, but it's wrong to assume that's the only thing that it's talking about because there's much more involved when we're talking about the fruit that we produce. Evangelism is part of that, but it's not all of that. It can't be because Jesus is talking about more here. 
John 15 is about relationship. It's about abiding. This is a love story. As we've talked about over and over again, the Bible is a true love story. It's a story of redemption. And John 15 fits perfectly within that story and within that thread of redemption. The price was paid and Jesus' blood was shed for the relationship. Yes, so that we could have forgiveness of sins. Yes, so that we could have victory over sin and death. But really it's about relationship. Redemption is about buying us back. God sent his son as the purchase price to buy us back. So it's about relationship. Read a little further in John 15, starting in verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. This I command you, that you love one another. It's not about production. It's about love and abiding. And please understand, I, I'm not saying that our productivity as a Christian is unimportant. I'm not saying that at all. It's just you can't get it twisted here. Because what I'm saying is that everything is unimportant without a relationship with Jesus Christ. In the absence of abiding, nothing really matters. You can produce fruit and you can do some good things, but what does it really matter? Our Lord is offering an invitation here in John 15, and the invitation is this. Abide in me and I abide in you. It's about connectivity. Because that's where our productivity as a Christian starts. That's where it begins. Otherwise, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, you go back to Matthew chapter 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. And these people talk about all the things that they did productivity-wise. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and all these things? And Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. Why? Because there was no relationship. It doesn't matter how productive you are if there's no relationship. Were these people bearing fruit? At least they said they were. And Jesus says, but it doesn't matter. You're not connected to me. And that's the important thing. Paul said this, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. That's a scary verse when you think about it, or verse is. Paul, in essence, is saying, you can be productive, you can do some good things, you can do some religious things, but if you have not love, if you're not connected, if you don't have the relationship, then what's it all matter? What matters is how, not how productive I am, but the reason for my productivity. It's not what I do, it's why I do what I do. Because I'm connected to the vine. We could apply this same sentiment to following Jesus' commands. You skip back one chapter to John chapter 14, verse 15. Jesus says, if you love me, you will do what? You will keep my commandments. If you love me. Because it's about the relationship. It's about doing what you do because of who you're connected to. He's speaking of abiding. He's speaking of abiding in God and God abiding in him. The Son and the Father are one. Once again, you see the relationship theme. It's all about connection. If you love me. It's not about just following the rules so that you can earn God's favor. We talked about this last Sunday night. Rules modify behavior. That's all they do. So trying to be a rule-following Christian so that you can please God, you're missing something. Rules modify behavior. There are many people in our world who follow all the rules for different reasons. Some people follow the rules of the laws of the land because they don't want to go to jail. Some people follow the rules because they don't want their character to be tarnished. Some people follow the rules because they want to seem upstanding and for people to respect them. It doesn't mean they're godly. 
There are plenty of people in our world who follow the rules that are not any closer to heaven than anyone else. So it's not just about following the rules. It's why do you follow the rules? Why were they put in place in the first place? Because God wants a relationship with you. And you follow those rules because you want a relationship with Him and you want to please Him, right? It's not what you do, it's why you do what you do. You can do all the right things and still not have a right relationship with God. Even Steve Jobs, who was not a Christian, said some good things. Even the atheist does some good things. You can produce fruit and not be connected to the vine. But Jesus is saying, what's it all matter if you don't have the right relationship? If love is not the catalyst, what's it all matter? Think about it this way. Guys, have you ever been sent to the grocery store by your wife to pick up some items? If you don't go to the grocery store on a regular basis, it can be quite intimidating. So your wife gives you a list. And for some of us, that list needs to be very specific. It would probably be good if we even had a picture next to whatever the item was, right? Because what if on the list was cereal? You ever been to the grocery store to look for cereal? They have their own aisle. There's one whole aisle dedicated to cereal. Good luck picking out the right one when the item is just cereal. Or how about milk? You know, there's 2%, there's low fat, there's whole milk, there's coconut milk, there's the red label, the blue label. I mean, what size do you get? How about peanut butter? You know, there's crunchy, there's extra crunchy, there's smooth, there's an eight ounce jar, there's a five pound tub. They even make peanut butter with jelly. You can buy them together because you don't want to be messing up two knives. So you get, you know, right there together. How do you choose when the list is vague? It can be quite intimidating. And so we need specifics sometimes. If we're not used to going to the grocery store and picking up those items, we need something that's more uh, uh, specific or more precise. Nowhere is it more difficult, though, when you're picking out fruit. I don't know what I'm doing there. I mean, I'm thumping it, I'm smelling it, I'm rolling it down the aisle like a bowling ball, (laughs) see if it breaks to the left or to the right, and, you know, I, I don't know what I'm doing there. But Jesus says when it comes to inspecting spiritual fruit, it's not that complicated. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. It's quite simple. Good connection, good fruit. Bad connection, bad fruit. As long as you live your life on the vine, you're going to produce quality fruit. Our branch dies and our fruit shrivels up when we lose our connection. Jesus said, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned up. Again, don't assume that Jesus is simply saying here, I'm going to go to hell if I mess up. That's how we read passages like this. If I do good, I go to heaven. If I do bad, I go to hell. And that's really all it's about. And all too often, we view passages like this by thinking, I've got to do this to earn his favor. If I don't do this, I don't earn his favor. But keep in mind, before productivity comes the relationship. And that's what this has to be about. That's where our focus needs to be. This is about abiding. What puts your soul in jeopardy is not a lack of productivity. It's not having the relationship. It's abandoning the relationship. It's not ever entering into the relationship in the first place. You're productive because you abide. Don't get the order mixed up. Don't get the cart before the horse. The picture of a vine and branches signifies a relationship of growth and maturity. Branches find their life in their connection to the vine. They are only productive as long as they are attached to the vine. When you're connected to the source, you grow and you mature and you produce good fruit. That's a natural byproduct. Productivity is a natural byproduct of being connected to the vine. But when you remove a piece of fruit from the vine or from a tree, what happens? It starts decaying. It starts going bad more rapidly because it no longer has its connection. It's kind of like a vacuum cleaner. Most of you have a vacuum cleaner, right? If not all of us, we have a vacuum cleaner. And there are so many attachments with a vacuum cleaner, even more so today than ever. You have a crevice tool, and you know, some of the more advanced vacuum cleaners even have a ceiling fan tool. You know, they have a brush with them, and of course, you can always do the normal pushing it across the floor so it sucks up dirt. But here's something about a vacuum cleaner that you probably already know. 
You can't buy one, bring it home, take it out of the box, and just start using it. You've got to plug it in. Because if you don't plug it in, you don't have a connection to the power source, and it doesn't work. And don't come up to me later and say, well, we have a battery-powered one. Okay. (laughs) If that's all you get from this, you really need to pay more attention. (laughs) It's your connection to the power source that makes all the difference. The same is true for a Christian. If we're not connected to the source of power, we are not as useful as we can be. And in fact, our productivity is meaningless. It's all about being connected. It's all about having that power to do the things that we do. But there's more. You've heard me say this before. So many times we read the Bible from a surface perspective and we don't ever really dig any deeper. And we've been talking about that over the last few years that we need to dig deeper. And when you dig deeper into the text, you've got to look at the original audience. You've got to look at who Jesus was speaking to first of all. Kind of like with the letters that Paul wrote. Paul wrote to a specific audience. He didn't write to you the first time, right? Doesn't mean we don't have applications. Certainly there is. There's principles involved, certainly. But, you know, it says to my most excellent Theophilus, you know, to the church in Philippi, that wasn't written to you. You're not the church in Philippi. You're not Theophilus. So when you look at the text, you look at the original audience, right? And so you look at what Jesus is saying to these people that were there listening to his disciples, to others that may have been in the crowd. What was he saying? Well, understand that Israel is pictured as the vine. Throughout the Old Testament, we see this. Isaiah 5 and 7, Jeremiah 2, 21, Hosea chapter 10, verse 1, Psalm 80 and verse 8. The vine is the symbol of Israel, of the nation. And now Jesus comes along and he calls himself, not just the vine, what does he call himself? The true vine. Why would he say that? Well, remember why Jesus came in the first place. What the prophets of the Old Testament spoke of was here in Jesus. They pointed to the coming Messiah who would expand the kingdom, not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles as well. And so if he is the true vine, what does that say about Israel? If they were symbolic of the vine, if the vine was symbolic of them, I should say, You know, Isaiah said that the vine had run wild. Jeremiah said something similar. And so Jesus comes along and says, you think you're the vine, but I'm the true vine. In other words, the only way to find salvation, the only way to find your place in the kingdom is to be connected to the true vine. To the Jew, your heritage, your bloodline isn't going to save you anymore. The kingdom has been expanded This is about Jesus. This is about accepting Him. This is about finding salvation through that sacrifice that was made one time and for all. A right relationship with God's true vine is the only way to have access to the kingdom. Now, believe it or not, I know a little something about grape growing. My grandfather was a master gardener, and he grew grapes in Arkansas. And if you know anything about growing grapes... You have to have the right soil. You you know have to have all these different uh, details worked out beforehand, even before you even try to grow grapes. It's a very meticulous process. Even when you start planting grapes and growing uh, the vine, you know it's three years before you really produce any yield of fruit. And so my grandfather was always out there tending to these grapes. And and the interesting thing about grapes is even when you start producing a good yield of fruit, you still cut branches. You prune them so that they produce even more. What seems like a drastic thing is actually for the vine's own good. So you prune these branches so they'll produce more grapes, but you always have dead branches, and you got to get rid of those. So you cut off the dead branches, and the dead branches aren't good for anything. Even in the Old Testament, when people would grow grapes, you know, a lot of times you brought wood for the altar sacrifice. You wouldn't bring the wood from from a vine, from a grape vineyard. The dead branches would burn because the wood was too soft. It wasn't good for anything. There was no good for that wood except to throw it out and burn it. You see the picture here that Jesus is painting? If you don't want to be thrown out, if you don't want to be burned in the fire, then you've got to be connected. And your connection 
is going to directly affect the production of fruit. So does this mean that God looks at people as disposable? Well, if we look at this passage from a productivity standpoint, then we can get that, that assumption, right? We can come to that conclusion. We think I don't do enough for the Lord. He's going to cut me off. He's going to throw me in the fire and I'm going to burn for all eternity. The reason why the dead branches were cut off and thrown into the fire was not because of their lack of productivity. I mean, yeah, it was, but I mean, that wasn't the major issue. What was the major issue? Because they weren't connected to the vine. There was no relationship. The Jews forfeited their opportunity because they did what? They rejected the Messiah. Hopefully you see that connection there. They refused the relationship. And I don't care who you are. If you refuse to be connected, if you refuse to have the relationship, then God is only going to give you what you've been asking for all your life. How could a loving God send people to hell? You send yourself to hell by the choices you make over and over. And if you choose not to be connected, then God will grant you what you have chosen all your life in eternity, which is separation from the Heavenly Father. You can talk about the licking fire and the brimstone and all that. That's not what makes hell hell. The worst part about hell is who's not there. To be separated from God for all eternity. Look at Jesus' words again. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Folks, a life on the vine is the best life. And it should be what each and every one of us desires. Above all else in life, we should be seeking to be connected to the vine. We should be seeking to abide because that's what Jesus is inviting us to. Abide in me and I in you. You will be productive. You will accomplish great things for the Lord if that is your motive, if that is your highest calling, and you're, you're striving for that each and every day. If you make that your goal, you will certainly enjoy a wonderful, joyful Christian life full of producing great fruit, bearing much fruit for Him. You know, I brought a vine this morning. Paisley asked if it was an olive branch. No, I, I couldn't find any olive trees on Iberus, but uh, I found this one. It's a real branch. This isn't fake, although it's not alive anymore, obviously. Let me ask you a question. If we were all to combine our efforts, could we make this produce fruit? Grant, thank you. No, no way. Now, we could, we could pray about it. We could all get together and we could pray about it. I could grit my teeth and close my eyes really hard and really try to use my powers of mental persuasion. We're not going to make this branch produce any fruit. You know, we could, uh, we could tape an orange to it, make it look like it was producing fruit, but that, that would just be uh, a falsehood. It wouldn't really be true, would it? I'm afraid that too many times in the Lord's church, we operate like this. We assume that because we're busy and because we're productive, that God is pleased and we are bearing much fruit. And I'm afraid sometimes churches are working really hard at different things. We got a lot of programs here, you know, whether preacher training camp or shine or, you know, whatever it may be. We do a lot of great things here. VBS, they produce a lot of great fruit. But if it's not connected to anything, what does it really matter? And we say, well, well, who's behind it? Who's behind VBS? Well, Stephanie is. Yeah, but I mean, who's really behind it? Who's behind preacher training camp? Well, Chris, Jake, and Blake. No, but who's really behind it? Because if it's, not, if it's not connected to something, then does it really matter? What good is it doing? If we're not abiding, it doesn't matter how busy we are or how many things we're doing as a church family. And we may think we're producing fruit and we're being productive, but if it's not a connection to the vine, then what does it really matter? If love is not the catalyst, what does it really matter? You see, a question that every church must ask themselves is, is what I do 
a result of who I'm with. Because we can be busy and we can program ourselves to death. But if we don't have the right motive and if God is not behind it, if we're not plugged into the power source, then what does it matter? It's not about productivity. It's about relationship. Some churches, I think, look like this branch. They seem to be alive. They may look alive, but they're not connected to the source. And therefore, what good is it? They're not plugged in. They don't abide. And you want to know what makes us who we are? You want to know what makes a church a mega church? Jesus. That's it. It's not numbers. It's not the crowd. It's not how many people you have on Sunday. What makes a church a mega church is Jesus. And if we want to be a mega church, then all we've got to do is be connected to the power source. That's it. And I pray to God that that will be our mission and that it will be our goal always. If you are not connected this morning, let us help you. Come as we stand and as we sing.